I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, uncertainties around China's COVID curbs, the human story and the technology story. What unrest means for Apple and iPhone production in the months ahead. Plus, sticking with Apple, the tech giant is being called out by none other than Elon Musk. The t Twitter chief tweeting at CEO Tim Cook, asking if the company, quote, hates free speech. And another one bites the dust. Crypto lender BlockFi has filed for bankruptcy in the aftermath of FTX, and the US government is among one of the key creditors. We'll explain. But first, Ed, let's check in on those markets because today was a day once again of Federal Reserve, of macro picture impacting the tech stocks. We're seeing the S&P 500 was off by 1.5%, biggest sell-off since November the 9th. Similar moves in terms of the Nasdaq off by 1.6%. Big tech rolls over as once again Fed speak seems to irk the market. Federal Reserve, the leaders over at New York Fed, for example, John Williams, or you're looking over at Jim Bullard over at St. Louis Fed, both talking about the need for further rate hikes. Rates go higher, the dollar goes higher, crypto goes lower. Bitcoin, of course, resets at this particular hour, but it has been trading lower versus the U.S. dollar, and we're seeing that at 16,206, down about 2% on the day of Monday. Today, it just resets, and we're calling it flat. Let's move on to see what also was irking investors was also this dampening on sentiment about what is happening in China, the protests. What's interesting to hear, though, is that the Nasdaq Golden Dragon China actually rallied. Why? Why, when you see unprecedented levels of protest versus Xi Jinping versus, of course, the concerns of a COVID lockdown? Well, maybe, just maybe, the Chinese stocks being traded here in the US were well, upside, Ed, because some think that actually that will mean a movement towards a reopening of the economy. We're up 2.8%. Yeah, e-commerce, a really big driver in the markets on individual names. I'm looking at Amazon, one of the three, few stocks in the green on the NASDAQ 100 on Monday. Probably the biggest points gainer as well. There's optimism around the sales outlook from Black Friday going into Cyber Monday, which is ongoing, of course. That stock higher by around six-tenths of 1%. Pindodo, really interesting, really strong earnings from a Chinese e-commerce giant on the lower end, the discount end, having its best day since August, the stock trading at its highest level in a year. Again, that story as well, Caroline, probably a factor that what we're seeing play out in China might result in a policy change which would be supportive for business and tech. Disney down 3%. According to people listening into Bob Iger's first town hall, they're going to keep with it when it comes to the hiring freeze and they're warning about a move from linear TV to thing. Activision's a stock we'll get into later. Very quickly, Apple, we've got to talk about this stock, Caroline, because it's under pressure with what we're seeing play out in China and the impact to production as well. Yeah, look at that. Over the last couple of days, Apple down 4.5%. You've been driving that story home, Ed. And let's dive into a little bit more because, well, it's been gripping the entire world. China's growing pro protests against COVID curbs and a record number of infections complicating the nation's path to reopening. Here's what some Bloomberg TV guests had to say about the sense of uncertainty just sweeping through Chinese markets. As long as we're seeing the, the ongoing COVID zero policy, we're not going to see, um, you know, much of a, a stabilization in domestic demand unless the government really moves away from its targeted approach. At this point, it looks like that a rapid or um, a reckless uh, opening of the economy will be worse for uh, China's growth because the biggest problem now, of course, is in the labor market. For the time being, it seems that the outperformance that we have seen in the greater China region um, could be capped in the very near term. The next few months are clearly going to be challenging, but we still feel comfortable that in the second half, China is going to be a much better story from an investment perspective. Interestingly, the mall is doing well, primarily because people can't travel. So we're seeing, seeing you know, a, a good spending and a good foot traffic in the mall. A macro perspective there. Let's dig into the technology impact as well. Bloomberg's Debbie Wu over in Washington. And, of course, Debbie, you cover in particular Foxconn. You t cover in particular Taiwanese companies as well as Chinese. And just talk to us about whether or not this is an unprecedented nature and what it really means for business, for the economy in China right now. Uh, so what we have seen is... Um... This is becoming a, a challenging uh, situation for uh, supply chain in China, although uh, White House said today that they don't see a uh, major impact on uh, supply chain uh, from uh, recent uh, 
protest or uh, uh, address in China over the weekend. And <clears throat> in this instance, Foxang over the weekend actually uh, is offering uh, existing uh, staff a, a monthly bonus of as much as uh, 1,800 uh, yuan to uh, continue working for uh, uh, the company in central China throughout uh, December and January. And that means uh, Foxang is uh, working very hard to uh, retain workers to uh, make sure that uh, uh, Apple will have uh, enough uh, iPhones to uh, offer its customers through uh, the holiday quarter. And our colleague uh, in uh, Asia have reported uh, uh, earlier this week that uh, Apple is, uh, and Vaxang are actually uh, facing a situation that uh, they could face a shortfall of uh, as many as uh, 6 million units of uh, iPhone Pros, the uh, most sold after uh, models of new iPhones this year due right. to uh, recent uh, turmoil in its, uh, at the uh, plant in central China. Debbie, do we have any sense of when things are going to normalize for Apple in terms of the production line? You mentioned the six million unit shortfall. I think the source also told Bloomberg that there was confidence they could make up ground in 2023. Uh, yes, but at the same time, the situation remains fluid because uh, we are not sure whether there's going to be a further lockdowns in the region that could uh, have an impact on the situation. So uh, another person familiar with the situation has told Bloomberg that uh, uh, existing workers affected by uh, uh, ongoing lockdowns uh, being unable to uh, return to work at the uh, Faxang's uh, plant in central China is a, a major F uh, factor affecting uh, production as well. So I guess we just have to uh, wait and see what happens uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks. Okay, Bloomberg, Debbie Wu, thank you very much. Let's continue the conversation now with Scott Moskovitz, Asia Pacific geopolitical risk analyst for the decision intelligence company Morning Consult. And I guess the question we go to now is, is this a flashpoint, Scott, or is this going to be an extended period of political social disruption in China in response to what is essentially policy, right, from the Chinese government? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, certainly, these uh, protests are unprecedented. They're unlike anything we've seen. The quickness with which they spiraled and the fact that they are taking place across multiple cities, across multiple geographies, and that somehow people in one city seem to be aware of people in other cities who were protesting and were you know, drawing inspiration from each other. That is something that we rarely see in China, where the state is normally so good at atomizing these things and sort of sweeping them under the rug. This is going to be much harder to put it back in the bottle, so to speak. Scott, already, of course, many an international company has been worried about doing business in China, largely because of the COVID lockdowns. And, and also add that a healthy dose of geopolitical tensions between, for example, the US and China antagonized in some way, perhaps over the course of the weekend, the news that ZTE and, and the likes of Huawei won't be able to sell their products into the US. How does this affect, for example, US-China relations going forward? Well, I don't know how much bearing this has specifically on U.S.-China relations, but U.S. officials have to tread really carefully here because they want to show their support and they want to express their support for any sort of you know, free and open protest, especially one that might you know, signal a greater desire even for democracy, some people have been talking about, which is you know, very rare. But the second U.S. officials step in and start you know, saying how much they support it, China can latch onto those sorts of narratives and start to spin it as... This is something that, you know, was cooked up by the U.S., start going to this sort of conspiracy theory, propaganda. And so that's something they have to tread very lightly, um, not just because they don't want to, you know, make the protesters look bad, uh, but also because that could also, you know, really harm U.S.-China relations, which are just starting to recover after the recent Xi Biden meeting. Scott, earlier today I spoke to the CFO of Infineon, a chip maker that has a, a significant operational and sales footprint in China. This is what he had to say about the situation. We have really improved our resilience uh, a lot over the, over the past quarters, uh, months and years. And uh, therefore we are looking at with, with concern that up to now there is no direct implication visible on our operations in China uh, or the region. And we have backup plans in case uh, it becomes necessary to make adjustments. When I listen to Sven, he makes it seem like this is just the latest in a string of ongoing disruption. What is your assessment about the reality of life on the ground and operating in China right now? 
Well, I don't get the sense that everything has ground to the halt, to a halt, but I do get the sense that we're in sort of a wait and see moment. It doesn't seem like they've been able to disperse these crowds. They sort of miss the window on you know censoring and isolating it right away. And even as they start to do that, people know that these protests are going on, and they you know are aware people are showing up with their blank pieces of paper. That's been the real prop of the protest. Um, whether it's sort of grinding to a halt, we saw you talked about earlier those. You know, protests in Zhengzhou, but those were those were more isolated. I get the sense that these are more, you know, urban middle class protests. We haven't seen so much labor protest outside of that. So it's a question, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And we know that sometimes COVID lockdowns have been used almost politically. And so, you know, anything is sort of on the table. We're really waiting to see how this will unfold. Now, I know in some ways what has occurred at the Foxconn iPhone city, as it's known, is somewhat different to what's happening now on the streets of Beijing, of Shanghai, but they are related. And a lot of this is frustration about the way in which people survive amid these COVID lockdowns, Scott. Many have been looking at Apple in this situation, of course, key supplier being that of Foxconn, their exposure being significant, that they just didn't build enough alternatives. They didn't focus enough. They were too heavily dependent as a supply chain on China and didn't do much to, to really disperse that. Do you think companies are now significantly moving away from a Chinese supply chain or will they look to just think that this is an episode? Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it predates this. I think it was over the summer, uh, you know, after House Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan and there was that deeply jingoist military uh, reaction, people got really spooked and they started for the first time to envision a future where China might become, for a lot of multinational companies, geopolitically off limits and they all started to scramble and start to think wow we need to look at serious contingency planning and things only seem to get worse from there that's what we saw in our data um you know relations seem to get worse and worse uh, uh, bilateral negativity only got worse and then this really did seem to be affecting both china and the u.s people were concerned she and biden met it seemed to calm temperatures not change anything but really right. put a floor under relations and then this happens, you know. So. Right. Scott, we asked our audience what's top of mind for them and concern about what's happening on the ground, specifically with Apple. Their answer very clear, working conditions. My question to you, those working conditions, what we've seen on the streets, do we see a policy pivot from the Chinese government? Yeah, I think one thing is that the government is sometimes more responsive than people realize in China because they don't have the release valve of, re of elections like we have. So they're going to have to move in order to quell dissent, but they have to be very careful because, you know, if they open up too quickly, then it could really embolden and enable these protesters. So I think they're going to tread lightly, but I don't see anything really terrible happening just yet. But we're waiting could be a victory for the protesters. We don't know. There might be small movements. You know. OK, Scott, Scott Moskovitz, Asia Pacific geopolitical risk analyst for Morning Consult. Thank you. Let's stick with Apple, the company and its CEO being called out by Elon Musk, who claims Apple has cut back its advertising on Twitter and even threatened to withhold the social network from its app store. Musk tweeting, quote, do they hate free speech in America? Question. Then posting again, this time including the Twitter account of Apple Chief Executive Officer Tim Cook. No response from Tim Cook on Twitter. We'll have more on that story later in the hour. And coming up, Activision Blizzard is gaining some fans why some analysts are raising their recommendation despite concerns over Microsoft's deal for a takeover. This is Bloomberg. Activision Blizzard has gained fans on Wall Street as a flurry of analysts raise their recommendations on the stock, even as Microsoft's planned acquisition looks more and more dicey. Joining us now is Bloomberg's m and reporter, Yuchin Shen. And Yuchin, just talk to us about what your reporting is showing. First and foremost, what are the odds that this deal actually goes through? 
Sure, yeah. So I will say um, I'm hearing from merger of traders as they see the deal probably is having only roughly 40 to 50 percent of going through. So it's pretty dicey. But it's interesting that we are seeing all among the Wall Street analysts, they're boosting their rating on the active Activision, the stock itself, uh, mainly for two re reasons, I would say. First, it's a strong fundamental value. And second, is it's a very attractive risk reward profile given the Microsoft situation. Because remember, Activision is in the process of uh, being acquired by Microsoft for $69 billion. That's a huge deal, right? But there was a report last week saying that the FTC, which is the U.S. regulator, is going to block and challenge the transaction. The stock, so the stock tumbled, right? But the analyst points is they see and they like the stock with or without Microsoft transaction. Because their case is being, as a standalone company, Activision, it has strong, fundamental, very solid growth outlook given its franchise, including right. Call of Duty, right? And they will get three billion breakup fee to add on the balance sheet, right? If the deal falls apart. But on the flip side, if you know it goes through, then look at where uh, the, the stock is trading. It's like 20% below the takeover offer. So that's a huge upside to capture in that scenario. Hey, Yuchen, you've taught me so much about the twists and turns of deal making. You know, you and I followed the Twitter deal so closely for months, for example. And the thing you taught me throughout that process, not just to crunch the numbers from the merger arbs, but it's to look out for key inflection points, mm -hmm. key decisions. So what's the big key decision or key moment we're looking for between Activision and Microsoft? Right. So I would say antitrust, uh, antitrust progress has always been the focus. So right now it's waiting on the approval from FTC, but also it's facing the probe uh, under UK CMA and European Commission. So regulators have raised a concern, you know, if this deal combining the number three and number five largest player in the industry will give Microsoft, you know, too much of advantage in a space, or if they will withhold popular titles against uh, their competitors. And I will say another thing to watch is just more broadly, um, FTC or the Biden administration has been have this very aggressive narratives around big tech players all years around, you know, uh, when it comes to antitrust issue. So that's particularly putting this mega tech deal under the spotlight. What's interesting, though, today, our great colleagues at Bloomberg Intelligence put out a piece, Jennifer mm -hmm. Reed, for example, talking about how actually Microsoft's no uh, new one-trick pony when it comes to M&A. They've been on mm -hmm. this rodeo before, yeah. and quite often they make concessions. Are we likely to see that when the ARBs are talking about this? Right, right. I think that's definitely something people are watch, and people are watching the next catalyst is um, when FTC going to drop um, their final decision on the case. Uh, on this deal. So I think media reports say that could come, you know, either uh, later next month or earlier next year. So it will depend on if they offer, so on the merger party side, if they offer some behavior remedy, but if, you know, the regulator accepts that. And if there's actually FTC decided to block the deal, then Microsoft still had the option to, they could appeal the case in the court. And remember, there's a similar case between uh, United yeah. House and Change House here, right? They got the uh, challenge from the OJ, but eventually when the court took approval on it, so that deal eventually closed out. Okay. Thanks to Bloomberg, Bloomberg's Yushin Shen on all things Activision. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest in the realm of tech layoffs from around the world. And before we head to break, let's take a quick look at Peloton. Shares up at one point as much as 8.8% Monday, highest since November 15th, pairing them afterwards. This, as Adobe Analytics says, exercise equipment performed well on Black Friday with sporting good calorie sales surging over the weekend. At the same time, the original Peloton bike being offered at a discount Monday on Amazon. This is Bloomberg. Two and a half years ago, we lost 80% of our business. We laid off 25% of our employees. And I said at that time that we are going to be now prepared for anything to come. We don't uh, need to lay off uh, half the workforce to achieve the efficiency levels that we 
want to achieve. We did announce a small restructuring. Ours is really about rebalancing. Uh, the number of headcount we had at the beginning of the year, we estimate we're going to have the same number of heads at the end of the year. We are not stepping on the brakes. In fact, we're stepping on the gas. We are still hiring. We're not freezing. We're not cutting. We're growing. That's what some of the biggest tech CEOs had to say about their own strategies surrounding layoffs. And in today's Talking Tech, we're taking a look at those companies that are not, well, so optimistic. In Mexico, used car startup Kavak is the latest global tech name to cut jobs. Latin America's biggest startup is reducing headcount and firing managers due to higher interest rates and a slowing economy. That's according to a memo from the Unicorns CEO seen by Bloomberg News. Now, Last week, HP said it would cut as many as 6,000 jobs over the next three years, joining names like Amazon and Cisco, who also plan layoffs. Right now, employment historically strong globally. The jobless rate was at 4.4% in September across major developed economies, according to the OECD. That's the lowest level since the 1980s. But this time around, tech already has staffing numbers way above pre-pandemic levels. Layoffs have already begun. So the sector's bracing for more cuts to come. That's Talking Tech. Karen. Really great global perspective. Let's get a little bit more global right now. Another story that's keeping our attention. The main privacy watchdog for Meta in the European Union has fined Facebook's parent company $277 million for a massive data breach. Now, Meta was penalised for failing to prevent the leak of the personal data of more than half a million users. The fine was imposed by the Irish Data Protection Commission. Meanwhile, coming up, what retail data can reveal about the state of the supply chain in this holiday shopping season. All these insights and more next from Ari Trasdal. He's the CEO and founder of the open data supply chain company, Crisp. This is Bloomberg. I think this intentionality actually is incredibly indicative of the state of the consumer. Consumers are really looking for value right now. They're looking for quality. They want to buy from their favorite brands, but they want a good deal from their favorite brands, and they're willing to wait, whether it's Cyber Fr uh, Black Friday or yeah. Cyber Monday, to buy that. But that's part of it. The second piece of it, and you mentioned this, Alex, in your in your opening, you talked about omni-channel. This idea that consumers want to buy whatever, in whatever means that is most convenient for them, whether that's online or offline on social media, that is now steady state. When you add that to direct to consumer is a business model which really connects the merchant and the consumer directly. I think that's the current state of, of retail and it's exciting. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. That was Shopify president Harley Finkelstein on Bloomberg Television a little earlier today. And Ed, you're taking a closer look at Shopify and other retailers post Black Friday. Just give us the big picture. Was it good? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the market seems to think it's been OK so far. Shopify gave some prelim numbers for Black Friday. The street seems bullish on those prelim numbers. There is evidence that the consumer is taking advantage of those deals. Some of the stocks we've been watching are the names that are in that e-commerce space. Amazon had a good start to Monday's session, kind of fell away. But Shopify, an outperformer, a lot of names on the sell side jumping on 
the early data coming out of them. Wayfair, another one. Peloton, interesting. According to Adobe Analytics, it really was a fit at-home fitness equipment that did well at one point up 8.8%, but really paired those gains to close up 8 tenths at 1%. Adobe Analytics data is where I want to go, actually. This is a third-party measure of how things are going in this holiday shopping season. For me, the psychology about when, which day, Caro, do you get out your laptop or go on your smartphone and buy something? And according to the data from Adobe Analytics, it's very much Cyber Monday. That is when across that holiday shopping period, as an individual day, they expect $11.2 billion to be spent. You look, for example, of Thanksgiving Day as a consp uh, comparison, Black Friday as a comparison. It seems like consumers need a few days to get over their turkey trip and get out there online to buy some deals. Now, this year relative to other years, let's look at 2022 and where we're headed. We do expect growth for 2022 across that holiday season. E-commerce spending in the United States, we're on track for $210 billion. That represents 2.5% gain on the holiday season in 2021 here in the United States. But I find that fascinating, Carrie, because it's still growth at a time where we're really worried about a slowdown in the economy. We're worried about the strength of the consumer. And what I'm reading in the data is actually discounting and deals seems to be doing the trick, albeit not in the same way it's done in previous years. Is it inflation adjusted? That's my key question. Let's put it to Ari Trasdell. Ed, a great setup, and we've now got the CEO and founder of Crisp with us, who can enlighten us as to the supply chain data, the platform that he brings for brands, for distributors, for retailers. You really give them an inside track on what's happening in terms of their own supply chain, how to make it more efficient, Ari. But just go back to that data, the growth. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing, on an inflation-adjusted basis, growth in terms of spending? Does it look healthy? It looks healthier, but I think at the same time um, have a lot of supply chain challenges still uh, looming. So you, you're seeing, it's kind of a paradox because you're seeing on one hand, you're seeing that uh, retailers are reporting uh, that they have too much inventory. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're reporting that they're out of stock. Um, so uh, retail is highly seasonal, uh, as you know, and uh, retailers are still struggling with, with getting their last uh, season and the season before that uh, sold. Uh, and at the same time, they have a lot of supply chain challenges getting the uh, seasonal products in for, for this upcoming, uh, upcoming period. Ari, I hear you a lot on the supply chain challenge side. And when we talk about supply chains, for Caroline and I, over the last 18 months, that's meant difficulty in moving goods from A to B. But the other issue we hear about is inventories. What role are inventories playing for some of these online retailers this holiday season? Yeah, they, uh, it's the same, it's the same challenge, really. You kind of have a very long supply chain to get, uh, get, get, get the inventory to the consumer. So you have retailers, you have distributors, wholesalers, you have manufacturers, importers, exporters, etc. And it takes a very long time for this uh, inventory to actually get through this entire uh, supply chain. So the numbers that uh, we got uh, a few days ago here is that 90% uh, of the retailers say that they have uh, too much uh, inventory. And at the same time, 88% the, uh, say that they are already starting to run out of uh, inventory for key items. So uh, historically, it's been very easy to plan or much easier to plan. But with everything that's going on now with, with, with inflation, consumer change, the huge shift to, 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 to online, for instance, it's made it really hard to plan because of very long lead times in the supply chains. Mm. Um, so, so that makes it hard when everything is not real time. Ari, I'm going to ask you to talk your book here, so don't gloat too much when you're talking about it. But let's think about the companies that have managed them inventories pretty well. Macy's was one of them. And actually, again, this is a company that's invested a lot in technology mm -hmm. in the ability to ensure that they got the right thing in the right time and be able to be a bit swifter about getting the things that are going to sell in the door. Talk to us about how your technology is perhaps helping alleviate some of the supply chain headaches that have been such a hallmark on basically every e-commerce and well, bricks and mortar store at the moment. Right, yeah. Before the pandemic, everybody thought we could push a button today and tomorrow the, the product would show up. Um, and uh, in, in, in reality, you really need a tremendous amount of data between the different trading partners. So where we started in, in food, food, there are over 10 million companies involved in getting food from where it's produced to where it's consumed. Um, but the technology that actually is 
connecting all of this is based upon something that was invented in 1973, the year I was born, which is called EDI. Mm -hmm. And it's very reactive in terms of purchase orders that go through uh, the whole supply chain. So everybody through the supply chain need to have real-time data so they understand what consumers are doing, what the price is, how much inventory exists. So everybody through the whole supply chain can have real-time uh, data. And then we avoid these huge overstocks that we've seen and uh, also the uh, shortages. That's interesting to me because you're talking about the company controlling what it can control. But how do you control the consumer? We went into this period knowing that promotions would be key. We knew that they would be greater than last year. I think the data shows us promotions were greater than last year. What's your analysis of the role that discounts played for the online retailers? I think discounts are incredibly important, but I think very often blunt instruments are used when you can have uh, surgical precision uh, instead. Um, and uh, in, to, in order to do surgical precision, you really need to understand what store is the product selling in, what's price point, how inflation uh, sensitive is that particular uh, area. So discounting uh, can be much more precise uh, in a way. Some care more about, um, about price than others, but you have to have really granular data now to the SKU and to the store level and also understand inventory levels and pricing and what competitors uh, are doing. So I think see, historically we've seen a lot of kind of blunt instruments uh, being used and you can have for a very little, affordable price you can use surgical uh, data instead to, to optimize. Talk to us about how that really works then. Say you realize that a lot more shoppers are wanting a particular item in Brooklyn vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in Minnesota and you can therefore have a cheaper price point. But with e-commerce being so prevalent, the fact that I can, while I'm in the store, pick up my phone and decide whether this is the price point I want to pay at or whether I can wait a couple of days and get it cheaper, how do you manage that amount of data the consumer has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you have to put together all of the consumer data, the data that the retailer have, the data that the distributor have, and the whole supply chain into one kind of north star in terms of uh, data understanding. Very many just look at their own data, but they are part of a big ecosystem uh, of, 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 of companies that all need, uh, need the data. So that sharing of data across companies was something that didn't happen as much before uh, the pandemic. Uh, everybody kind of operated in their own uh, silo. Um, but now people see that sharing data uh, matters a lot because then the manufacturer can be ahead of it. They can one, um, uh, build their products and they can get the products out in, uh, in time. Now the retailers have a tremendous amount of product sitting that uh, was for the last, uh, last season. So uh, getting there in time, uh, that's, when, uh, that's, that's incredibly important. It's November 28th. Give us the RE Trasdal outlook for the rest of the holiday season, which seems to go on indefinitely. <laughs> That's always the holiday season, season in retail, which is, which is incredible. So I, I, I think we're going to see, see continued spend uh, in, uh, in Q4, uh, 6, 7, 8 uh, percent uh, increase in spend in Q4. Uh, I still think we're going to see a lot of uh, price reductions, um, and we're going to see a lot of shortage, shortages of products. I think a lot of people are going to realize that uh, the supply chain crisis are, are not over, um, and uh, that is going to continue kind of to ripple through uh, the supply chain. All right. Ari Trasdow, CEO and founder of Crisp. Thank you. Coming up, the crypto chaos continues. In the aftermath of FTX, BlockFi has now filed for bankruptcy, leaving more traders with trapped money. We discuss the latest next. This is Bloomberg. same confidence and the full confidence in Coinbase that we've seen previously, and we do not see anybody leaving the space. And that said, given that EMEA, and when I mean EMEA, I not only mean the European Union with the MECA regulation, but also the financial services and markets bill that passing through the UK Parliament at the moment, as well as the creation of the VARA, the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority in Dubai, is really leading the charge in creating regulatory clarity and a, a regulatory framework that we can work within. 
Daniel Sifa there, EMEA Vice President and Managing Director of Coinbase. Now, let's talk about confidence more broadly in the space, particularly after today's perhaps inevitable news that BlockFi has finally had to file for bankruptcy. Joining us now is Blue Motion Ali Basak. And I say finally because it was anticipated because the white knight had been the now bankrupt FTX for them previously. We have been expecting a filing and reporting now for at least a week here that this would be expected at some point. And now we have some details. And what do we have from them? We have not just the plan to file for bankruptcy in New Jersey. We have some details about the scope of how big this bankruptcy proceeding is going to be. So $1 billion to $10 billion in assets is the general size of BlockFi. It's quite a large size. <laughs> quite a large size, but more than 100,000 creditors. We would have to keep an eye on future filings to see how many that will ultimately be. Remember, FTX also had checked that last box on their filing and it found out later that was about a million people at play here that we we're talking about. We also know that the concentration is different among the unsecured creditor group. So what is that exactly? It's more than 700 million that is really highlighted here, earmarked to the trustee of different depositors, FTX itself, which we'll talk a little more about, I know. And then also you have the SEC from the remainder of a Number four, right? They're the four <laughs> exactly. biggest creditor. So uh, there are a lot of names that you don't have here, similar to FTX, but you know that those amounts are kind of isolated here between $1 million and $30 million. So you might see more contagion there among the uh, people that they're owed money to because you don't know what they'll get back yet, but we know that that is the general size of uh, per, per customer, per creditor here, that is owed money and how much generally they're owed. There's a question of chronology and timeline because it's clear BlockFi had issues before FTX's collapse, but at the same time, FTX's collapse seems to have made things worse for BlockFi. Um, if you follow that, Sonali, what is the relationship now between the two? The claim here on the bankruptcy filing is about $275 million for FTX earmarked. There's some really interesting unanswered questions here, Ed. If you look at the testimony by uh, an advisor here, you had seen that they didn't get money. They didn't get all the money that they had asked for from FTX to begin with, according to the Block 5 filings. Now, remember, to your point, some of these issues started before FTX. That's why FTX got involved in the first place. They were related to three arrows. In FTX's filing, I would also point out that apparently the U.S. business of FTX lent money to BlockFi in part through that FTT token. And so my question here is this entire agreement, who owes who what and who is responsible for actually paying each other back after this uh, kind of tight web that needed uh, knitted in, after the three arrows debacle, I think is interesting. Now, remember, BlockFi has also said that getting money back from FTX might take time given FTX's own bankruptcy. So things are certainly complicated between the two. Shanali, over the weekend, it looked as though much of crypto Twitter decided to up sticks and leave to the Bahamas at some point and do their own digging in some way, shape or form. That is because of the different jurisdictions with which FTX has been enveloped. Same thing here with BlockFi a bit. Obviously, Chapter 11 is, in a, is a protection here in the U.S., but it wasn't just based in the U.S. I spent an inordinate amount of time with bankruptcy lawyers <laughs> today for that reason, because it, to that end, they and the had... the only people that win, Shanali. Truly. In this case, I will tell you just how much in a moment. But for BlockFi, they filed a petition with the Bermuda Supreme Court here so that they would have provisional liquidators in both regions now. Remember, from Bahamas' point of view for FTX, there is a lot of dispute that has occurred since the bankruptcy proceedings have begun, and to the point that you even have the Attorney General saying that some of the words that have come from the new FTX CEO are regrettable. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that the Bermuda government and the U.S. stay in line in this bankruptcy filing, again, they want to recoup money for their customers, for their own people, and at the end of the day, what it seems like from the statements we're seeing from the Bahamas is also a redefine the credibility of every single jurisdiction's financial system and ability to embrace crypto still, yeah. but have tight rules around the industry such that people don't lose their funds. We've got to go, Shanali, but you teased us. How much are the bankruptcy lawyers Six winning? Six million dollars. It's all right for some. Shanali Basak, we thank you so much. She's going to go back to those bankruptcy lawyers now. Meanwhile, coming up, Elon Musk picks a fight with Apple. We'll tell you why next. This is Bloomberg.
today, Elon Musk has once again been going viral on his own platform and others. This time, he's stirring a fight with none other than Apple. Now, Musk says Apple has halted most of its advertising on Twitter and asked the company, quote, if they hate free speech in America. He even appealed directly to Apple CEO, asking, what's going on here, Tim Cook? He also went on to accuse the company well, of threatening to remove the platform from its app store. He did set, not say why, though, and now, this all comes as many companies have halted spending we know on Twitter and made concerns about Elon Musk's content moderation plans for the site. Watchdog site, in fact, Media Matters, reported last week that half of Twitter's top advertisers had pulled their advertising on Twitter after concerns about the direction of Twitter. Look, Ford Jeep among them. Elon Musk, meanwhile, has been blaming activists for pressuring advertisers and has talked about Twitter seeing a massive drop in revenue already. He said in the past that he wants to make money for Twitter by turning it into a paid subscription service with a relaunch of its paid verified services due Friday, of course. But for now, the vast majority of Twitter's revenue still comes from advertising. Ed? Yeah, let's stick with this story. Bring in Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, our social media reporter, for more. I mean, Kurt, there's a lot to unpick here. What happens if Apple took Twitter off the App Store? I guess that's the place to start. Sure. I mean, that's a pretty dramatic outcome, right? Like this would be that Twitter is routinely, uh, you know, allowing uh, terrible content on the platform. Usually Apple reserves this for, you know, uh, egreg egregious violations. And so if this were to be the case, of course, uh, that's a huge blow to Twitter, right? The App Store is, is probably um, the main way or one of the main ways that most of its users get the app, get app updates. So, you know, for example, I believe the app would still work on my phone, but in order to, you know, get an updated version, I have an iPhone, I might have to, you know, figure out a way to download that from the web. It's the kind of thing that's going to erode over time and cause a lot of people to either stop using Twitter or, or you know, uh, possibly have to move to a different device. And so that's a huge issue. And one of the reasons I tweeted that I think Twitter needs Apple a lot more than Apple mm. needs Twitter here. And that's because Apple has the distribution at its, at its fingertips. And actually, I was pretty surprised that, Apple was one of the biggest advertisers with Twitter. Kurt, meanwhile, the cryptic sort of war almost he's declared on Apple continues. <laughs> right. And talk to us about what he means by a free spree speech suppression. He, says he's, he said in a tweet, what, that Twitter files on free speech suppression will soon be published on the social media platform. What does he mean? What's he going to declare on that? Well, we don't know, but he's certainly kind of uh, piquing our interest, right? He's saying, hey, look, now that I'm inside the building, now that I've had time to figure out, you know, what's been going on in the code or behind the scenes, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of unveil what Twitter has been hiding from you this whole time, right? And, and presumably, um, the way I'm reading that is that means he's going to come out and say, you know, here are the types of tweets that maybe were downranked in the algorithm, or here's the types of accounts that had been removed that maybe you didn't know about. Again, this is speculation, right? Because he's he's intentionally sort of building this drama there. But again, you know what he has tried to say all along is that he is this free speech uh, kind of evangelist, and he's going to come in and he's going to make Twitter the free speech version of the service that people want it to be. That it has not been because it has you know rules around what you can and cannot say. Kurt, we know the new look verification systems coming Friday. What has Musk said? What are the details? Yeah, well, he mentioned, and I think we talked about this, Ed, actually on Spaces on Friday when we were there, that there's going to be a series of different colored badges, right? At least that's the plan for now. And, and I'm, I'm going to forget the colors off the top of my head, but presumably, you know, uh, you might have one color if you are an elected official. You might have another color if you are a brand um, or if you're uh, running kind of a, an account that's uh, representing, you know, a company versus a, an individual person, right? And so this is actually not a new idea. This is something that folks have uh, inside Twitter have kicked around for a long time before Elon showed up. This idea that maybe there should be different kind of labels for different accounts, including one for bots, believe it or not. There was uh, an idea that, you know, maybe bots should exist on Twitter, but they should be labeled as bots so that you know you're interacting with uh, kind of an automated account. So as you know, uh, Ed and Caroline, this plan for verification has changed almost daily for the last couple of weeks. So we'll see what it looks like when we actually see it live. But as of now, you know, it seems to be that he's starting to get a little bit more strategic around. Um, instead of everyone gets the blue check, there's going to be different variations of that. Green, gold, blue. We wait to see what the rainbow is going to be like. Yeah. Kurt Wagner.
So great that you join us on Spaces. That was a nice little tease. You've got to come and join us on Friday nice. on our Twitter Spaces. And indeed, then digging a little bit more on what's happening. I'm sure there's going to be plenty to discuss come Friday. It's only Monday, Kurt. We're going to let you get back to your day job, which is tracking what Thank that you. cryptic tweet does indeed <laughs> mean. But Ed, it really is a story that continues to unfold. And the fact that Elon Musk, yes, the wealthiest individual, is taking on yeah. Apple and almost retweeting out there what some of the videos the Epic Games made about Apple's business practices. Yep. It really does feel like he's going for them. It's gold check for companies, grey check for government and blue for individuals, by the way, Caro. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure to join us again tomorrow. AWS CEO Adam Zlitsky joins us as Amazon kicks off its annual cloud conference. You don't want to miss it. This, Caro, is Bloomberg. <laughs>